appreciate it. Uh, second one, I, as a, an expert in international politics, I would you see, Max, a diplomatic solution, a diplomatic, I would say, a leverage uh, to stop Russian counterparts who are taking part in uh, in in this gray zone, helping Russia to um, uh, to get those loopholes uh, to import the the most needed goods. So, is there a diplomatic way to uh, stra to to stress and to to strike? on their partners uh, in the world that would be really effective and, and block this parallel economy that is Russia, uh, the Russia's building. Thank you very much for asking this brilliant question. This is honestly now, because once I hear diplomatic solution to any question, I would always tell people that there is kind of, you know, a popular misbelief the diplomatic solution is something that people sit like well-dressed people in their suits, they sit by the round tables, they, you know, exchange polite phrases in received pronunciation of the British standard saying like, would you mind p -p -p ending this war? And say, of course, I beg your pardon for invading Ukraine and we withdraw our troops immediately. Oh, thank you very much. Would you like to compensate for damages you inflicted on Ukraine? Oh, yes, of course, we'll do it right away, please. Go and then they continue, you know, to drink in tea with the fingers like that. That will never happen. This is something that is very, very wrong. And a diplomatic solution is a misperception, especially person like by Jürgen Habermas and maybe, maybe many others, German intellectuals whom I do not follow, who say that oh, please do not do not pump arms into Ukraine, do not support Ukraine military because there might be a diplomatic solution. And what is meant, and this is one of the way to misuse the concept of diplomatic solution, is putting people by the table so that they discuss, apologize, find something in between kind of solution, you know, to appease Putin so that he would be satisfied and the war will end the next day. And this is very wrong. So by diplomatic solution, this is something that Russia is pressing. This is exactly why Russia wants a sort of negotiation agenda, because it's not about real negotiations, it's about Russians finding time and resources to what we asked me before, to re actually uh, to have enough arms to kill us Ukrainians, to destroy Ukraine. Another point with diplomatic solution, it will definitely come after Russia's surrender. And now, uh, at the point we win this war, and we will have to, once we are so far as to sign a peace treaty with Russia, after we retook our lands and all this, all this have happened, then we can have diplomacy in me, by means of diplomacy. Now, by diplomacy, I mean, we will have negotiations on how Russia will pay us back, how Russia will return, for example, you know, the news from this week, Ukrainian children who are taken hostages by Russia to different camps, kind of filtration camps, where they're brainwashed to fall in love with Putin's Russia. And this is a disgrace. This is a true war crime. So this is a point where all the diplomacy comes discussing how Russia will repay, how Russia will return and, and compensate for the damage. And that is diplomacy. It's not about Russian. The, the third point I would like to see, yes, diplomacy is another thing, is that uh, people, especially there are our partners like the United Kingdom and the United States of America, they're very good at showing Russia what the diplomats can do in a different context, showing uh, showing how they are dissatisfied with what Russia, do, what Russia does. And on the other hand, there are other countries who are kind of undecided, like India, China, China is a separate point, but who really uh, use this diplomatic language to play, like, to, you know, to play uh, this game like if nothing happened, like if something going on in Europe far away from where we live, and this is a different point. But to sum up my three points, first, I think Russia misuses this concept of diplomatic solution and this is like, this is a joke. This is a, it cannot happen. This is not feasible. It is not a solution. Secondly, we will have true diplomacy in place once we negotiate uh, the, all, 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 all these things I've mentioned, really, how Russia will repair the damage, things like that. And thirdly, the diplomatic things is like, once we hear the, uh, the, you know, the Red Cross and their position, this international community, once we hear some international organization that, that, uh, that urge for both parties to find a solution. This is a very wrong diplomacy. It's not about actually helping Ukraine. It's, I've heard you know, this very interesting uh, comparison, which may be a bit rude, so please, I beg your pardon for that. But actually, like, if a guy like uh, here on the street rapes a lady, and there is somebody, and the lady tries, really, she resists, she really fights back. And there is somebody who comes and says, you both, you both have to stop. You see? And this is, this is really, this is the disgrace 
to call this action a diplomacy. It is not a diplomacy. It's very, it's a, it's a great comment because, you know, after Zelensky's speech, um, there was an interview that Christiana Manpur did with Olaf Schulz. And she actually makes a comment that it takes two to tangle, referring to Zelensky, i.e. equating some sort of actions between uh, Ukraine and Russia. And that's part of that victim blaming mentality that you see in some of those Western journalists that, well, Ukraine did something wrong. In other words, in equating certain actions, it's this sort of sense of, of moral uh, equivalency. And there really isn't a moral equivalency here. And it's a very, very deep-seated, Russophilic outlook that because Ukraine didn't want to, because Ukraine followed its own path and is building its own separate society, that that somehow is the issue that is um, offensive to Russia and therefore to people, not all, not every institution, but it's offensive to some in the West because they conflate Ukraine and Russia. And, and when she said that, I thought, you know, that's, that's the problem. If you're going to say it takes two to tango, then why doesn't that construct apply to exactly the, the metaphor that you use is, is that, that when a woman fights back against being raped, she is somehow the one that caused the rape. And, and it's a high time for people like Christiana Manpour and probably several others to take that into account because what they're doing, it's, it relates back to colonialism, that, that somehow that, that the, um, in an abusive relationship that the, the person who's being abused is somehow wrong or that they've done something to invoke the rage of the abuser. All of these things are, are what I find to be really offensive being here in Ukraine and, and growing up with, uh, in the Ukrainian community in Canada. Uh, in the United States. Regarding Zelensky's speech, I'll say this. Um, I think that his speech was brilliant. His... I'm, not, I'm not interrupting you, just like, you know, popping up with a remark. I just got a deja vu listening to you and thinking of this. I, I, I got a deja vu of a life that I never lived through, which is, I, you know, it, it feels like you live in times so far, I Harper Lee's To Kill a Mockingbird. It's a 12 angry man story, you know, happening on a geopolitical level. This is something very close to that. And this was just a remark. I'm sorry, my friends. Uh, so keep on rolling. Uh, yeah, the, the, regarding the speech, I think it was brilliant for, for one really, really important message. Uh, for, for 12, almost 12 months now, the Western uh, world, the audiences in the West have heard that uh, Ukraine is asking or Ukraine is looking for handouts. It's often been used as a, as a weapon by certain members, granted a, a minority member within the American Congress of the GOP, that they're not going to fund this war forever. Um, but in, in saying that the, using the geographical metaphor with all the rivers, I think that was a brilliant comment because what he does at the end is that he makes everyone there own the victory. And that's really important in building a coalition. And if you notice, he even used the word uh, coalition of victory. That's a really important concept. And it's really important for people. And maybe we're, we've crossed that Rubicon where people like Schulz, Macron, um, certainly we've crossed it with the UK uh, in, in their support for Ukraine. I think we're getting close to crossing it in the United States. Um, uh, he makes them own owners, co-owners of, of Ukrainian victory. Um, and another thing, I think he throws down the gauntlet, the, the, the warning that uh, the Putins, the plural, are out to corrupt your institutions and social life with disinformation campaigns. We've, we've been on, the, on the, you know, the, the tip of the spear of fighting disinformation. School of Journalism at Kiev Mohel Academy, where uh, Maxim teaches, it, it started one of the first, um, I would say, comprehensive approaches to combating Russian disinformation. And we see it all the time. I mean, we, we see the amount of Russian disinformation in the Ukrainian ecosystem, information ecosystem, 
And I think, and I, I, I really am being a bit more optimistic today about things that the Western um, media outlets are also going to take note. I don't have much data to support my optimism, but I, I do think that it, we're on the right track. So um, great, great analysis, uh, Maxim. Thank you very much. Thank you. If I just if 